Right. So yeah, um, thanks very much for inviting me. I've um, always wanted to go to Santiago. Yeah, <laughs> um, <but> maybe. <laughs> it will maybe, happen. Uh, it will happen. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be great. That would be great. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, for now, I'm really pleased to be here virtually and uh, really um, enjoyed the discussion yesterday. There we go. Okay, good. So yeah, my topic is epistemic Phariseeism. Okay, so uh, Roberto and Emilio asked me to present on reformed epistemology. Uh, I don't know if you guys in the phenomenological tradition are familiar with that. It's a view in analytic philosophy that has to do with um, the conditions in which a person is uh, rational or justified in, in believing and in having religious beliefs or in which their beliefs are, amount to knowledge. And I said, well, happy to do that as long as you're okay with me being critical of reformed epistemology. Um, and they said, that's absolutely fine. So here we go. I'm going to argue that, um, so reformed epistemology, which belongs to a cluster of views that I put under a broader heading that I call um, divine help epistemology for reasons that you'll see in a second. Um, uh, yeah, so it says, says, says the following. Um, it's, it's committed to the claim that it's, it's a kind of, it's a view st uh, coming out of Christian theology, but it's supposed to be applicable to any broadly monotheistic uh, worldview. So the idea is that um, the world as we have it is fallen. Um, you know, Christians use the term sin, um, but the idea is that the world is fundamentally deeply, deeply imperfect in such a way that people's cognition is also imperfect. We are unable to form accurate beliefs about religious matters uh, by ourselves, including God. Um, so that's the bad news on this view. The good news um, on reformed epistemology and these views that I call more broadly divine help epistemology is that God, thankfully, comes along and he says, well, you guys cannot come to believe in me by yourselves. I'm going to help you. I'm going to fix your cognitive mechanisms. I'm going to fix your brains so that you can come to know about me. And so he repairs the cognitive ability of certain people, but not everybody. Okay, he, he repairs the cognitive ability of people who then become his faithful believers. Um, and so we have then this view that there's everybody is born into this cognitive fallenness. Some people are fortunate enough to have God come and elect them to come to know about him. And the others uh, just don't. They remain atheists or whatever else. And um, so this view is basically spearheaded by uh, Alvin Plantinga, basically, um, who, who called it reformed epistemology. He said later that he came to regret naming it that because it sounded too partisan, but um, the name stuck. And uh, but it's also held by a number of other people. Um, and I have a couple names on the on the on the screen there. Um, so what it does is, is basically works from a monotheistic worldview and just in in order to dialogue with this idea, this, this reformed epistemology, this what I'm going to call divine help epistemology, because God comes along and helps you form beliefs about him, um, I'm going to just suppose for argument's sake that the religious worldview that it's operating from is broadly true or accurate, just so that I can enter into conversation with this with these people. Because I want to show that divine help epistemology is problematic on its own terms. I want to show that even if um, the Christian or broadly monotheistic picture that it works from is broadly the right picture, it's still a really problematic view by its own uh, standards. So what I'm going to argue is that divine help epistemology promotes a cluster of epistemic vices that I call epistemic Phariseeism. Um, now I should say in advance that so divine help epistemology is all about how you can believe rationally in God. We saw yesterday in Emilio's presentation that you know some people think faith shouldn't even involve rational belief in God. That's a different conversation. Um, reformed epistemologists, these guys, they, they say, say, well, well it's, it's really great. good to have rational beliefs in God because uh, they just have a completely different picture of faith. Um, and so I'm going to say that this picture of faith, you know, whatever you think, um, it gives rise if you form beliefs in accord with their uh, epistemic norms, that it encourages you to um, to develop certain epistemic vices, and that just means that it encourages you to develop certain bad habits of thinking. 
that um, are in contrast to epistemic virtues, which are good habits of thinking. Now, I just want to say uh, I'm calling these this cluster of vices epistemic Phariseeism. I don't mean in any way to refer to the uh, you know, historical or, or uh, biblical characters, the Pharisees. This view is inspired by them, but really, really? Uh, not, not by them. This view is inspired by the sort of stories and anecdotes that um, in our culture have come down uh, in various particularly Christian religious traditions um, that refer to a certain kind of hypocrisy that um, is, is inspired by these characters. But I'm not talking about the characters, I'm talking about this cluster of vices. And that's why I'm using a lowercase p, because I'm not making any claims about these people, uh, you know, whoever they really were historically. Um, right. And that my claim holds, my criticism holds, even if we basically accept this broadly monotheistic picture. So I'll say a little bit more about the specific form of divine help epistemology that I'm criticizing, reformed epistemology. The idea, as I already mentioned, is that God, uh, and lots of people spell this out in different ways, but the way reformed epistemology says that God repairs our cognition is that um, he, he repairs our ability to perceive. Um, so not, not quite kind of seeing or hearing or smelling, but there's a special cognitive ability that we have to kind of perceive God in this kind of mystical way. Um, so that when God repairs this special uh, ability, we can um, recognize that he was at work in a given situation, or we can kind of read the Bible and kind of recognize that his word is speaking through it, or we can have a religious experience where he seems to be present to us or something like that. Now, what's really important, um, getting a little notice there. Yeah, okay, good. So what's really important here is that what reformed epistemology builds into this idea that God repairs our perceptual abilities is that he also repairs a special uh, perceptual abilities that we might call intellectual seemings and that just means you know like if you um if you see uh you know the the sentence you know two plus one uh, two plus two equals four it seems to you obviously true um at this stage in your career in any case and that that kind of seeming that it's obviously true is an intellectual seeming um it, it's, a, it's a form of experience it's a form of perception and what um, Plantinga in particular says explicitly in his big book, uh, uh, Warranted Christian Belief, is that God repairs those too. And that means that you can perceive in this intellectual way, the truth or the, the validity uh, or the, the soundness of arguments that speak in favor of God's existence. Um, or, or you can just sort of, um, you know, you can kind of trust your intellectual abilities to guide you in the right direction. So, yeah, planting, he says, um, in the, the pages that I cite you, we have a powerful inclination to believe and that that in itself is an important piece of evidence, um, experiential evidence. Now, the thing about reformed epistemology is it says, okay, so this is about why we are entitled perhaps to hold our religious beliefs, because we have these experiences, religious experiences, um, intellectual seemings, and we can trust that God has divinely repaired our abilities to have those be accurate. However, uh, reformed epistemology is really not so interested in our internal entitlement. It's more interested in knowledge. So it says, you know, as, as long as, you know, God does the work, you have these seemings and these seemings kind of justify you internally. But what's really important is God's doing the work to give you knowledge. Now, the thing about this view is that this kind of internal entitlement that you get, it belongs, can belong to non-believers too. Even if God, you know, by, by hypothesis, God does not repair the cognitive abilities of non-believers, he kind of leaves them to kind of to wallow in, in their untruth. At the same time, they can still enjoy this in very, very internal perceptual justification of their beliefs because they have seemings too. They can just think, well, um, you know, from my internal perspective, I have seemings and you know, that's okay, I'm justified in believing. Um, but of course, according to reformed epistemology, non-believers are not, they, they cannot have knowledge because those seemings are uh, mistaken because they were not given by God. They do not give you accurate information about religious aspects of reality. So we have two groups here. We have the believers who are have this kind of internal justification on the basis of their perception, which happens to be accurate because God has repaired it and gives you knowledge. On the other hand, we have the group of non-believers who can also enjoy internal 
justification because of their internal seemings and experiences and whatever, but they cannot enjoy knowledge, at least about religious matters, because God did not repair their faculties. So there are these two groups of people that we get on reformed epistemology, and that will become important in the following. So um, I've argued elsewhere, I won't go into it here, but it's just an important aspect of these cognitive vices that I want to talk about, that when you have an epistemology that strongly privileges uh, these intellectual seemings and these individual experiences, it tends to give rise to what I, what I call noetic entrenchment is a kind of dogmatism, a kind of maybe fundamentalism even. And that means that you're just kind of, because you're, you're sort of relying on your internal perspective so much and saying, well, God you know, has graced my internal perspective so um, I can just kind of rely on it. You, you, you might tend to become a little bit uncritical. And, and, I, and I argue elsewhere that this might tend to make you noetically entrenched, a little bit dogmatic. Um, and the reason is that, that your internal perspective is not just you know, divinely inspired, assuming that it's divinely inspired, but it's also um, the, the kinds of experiences and, and, and beliefs and, and, and everything that, uh, that are most susceptible to your own biases, your own kind of infusion of values to group think in your community. So there's this little danger that I've argued elsewhere reformed epistemology is susceptible to. Um, and, and this little danger, I think, can play itself out um, more broadly in the vices that I'm going to discuss, but the vices take on a life of their own. Um, Right. So, and this is even if we grant that the broadly religious worldview is accurate. So even if God does inspire your religious worldview um, and, and your, your experiences, um, you can still kind of bring in a prejudice and groupthink of your own to kind of uh, make God's divine inspiration a little bit less accurate than it might otherwise have been. So, um, right. So just keep in mind that this, this dogmatic tendency might arise. Okay. So, now I'm going to talk about Phariseeism, and then I'm going to say what I mean by these vices of epistemic Phariseeism. Phariseeism, just this cluster of vices, lowercase p, is a form of hypocrisy, which we may understand um, following Rossi as an essentially vicious form of inconsistency between what you sort of believe and think, um, or between what you believe and think and what you how you act. So um, you know, if you believe that, you know, one shouldn't smoke and you preach that one shouldn't smoke, but you smoke, then you're inconsistent. Your, your beliefs and your actions are inconsistent. Um, and there are these two kinds of inconsistency uh, that you can just see there. So um, just for, for those of you who aren't that familiar with the original characters who inspired this, um, this, this notion of hypocrisy that we call Phariseeism, it comes in the New Testament. Um, and uh, I think it's the Gospel of Matthew, if, if, if I remember correctly. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, should know that. Um, so the idea here is Jesus is telling a parable, um, this kind of you know moral story, and there is this this Pharisee, this this very learned man in his society, who's also uh, I don't think he's a priest, but he's a very learned um, learned man and very highly respected, and. And then there's, there, he's in the synagogue uh, praying and in the synagogue with him, there's this other guy who is like the lowest of the low in his society. He's a tax collector. He works for the Roman empire extorting money from the Jewish community. Um, so, so the Jewish community, um, you know, perhaps rightly so doesn't like him very much. Um, and uh, he regards him as an outcast. And so the Pharisee is there praying to God. He stands at the front of the temple and he's just kind of saying very loudly, um, Lord, thank you that I, am not like that tax collector in the back of the synagogue, that I am virtuous and, and so forth. And the tax collector is just kind of minding his own business and feeling very kind of humble and ashamed. Uh, and in contrast, he prays to God and uh, recognizes his sinfulness and acknowledges that he has sinned before God. So this is the story that, ins not, not the story, but this is one of many stories that inspires this idea of, you know, Phariseeism as a form of hypocrisy, kind of the, the, the Pharisees kind of hypocritical, um, not recognizing that showing off and bragging and arrogance are sins of their own. So, okay, so now I'll talk about the four vices that make up what I think of as, as uh, Phariseeism, and I'll say what their epistemic counterparts are, what makes, so how these, these vices can play themselves out when it comes to forming beliefs. 
So the first vice is uh, self-righteousness, which we can recognize in the story. So it's a form of arrogance in which you have an inaccurately high estimation of your own moral or religious qualities. If the Pharisee in the story were really that great, um, he probably wouldn't be showing off and putting somebody down, but he is. So we can say that he's self-righteous. Um, an epistemic analog of that I would suggest is epistemic self-righteousness. Here, um, you overestimate your epistemic abilities. You overestimate how skilled you are at forming beliefs in certain areas. And you do so not just because you think you're great, but you do so specifically because you think that there's something morally or religiously special about you. For example, you think that you take yourself to have been cognitively healed by God specially. Um, and I think this, you know, an epistemic vice fundamentally is something that, um, you know, a, a, a habit of forming beliefs that makes your beliefs on the whole sort of less accurate or detracts from knowledge or detracts from understanding or something like that. And I think epistemic self-righteousness counts as a vice because if you overestimate your epistemic abilities uh, because you take yourself to be religiously or morally special, then you're apt to make certain kinds of mistakes that that um, that kind of that you don't recognize, kind of like the Pharisee does in the synagogue. All right, the second vice that um, and on, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to list the vices, and then subsequently I'm going to show more um, more in more detail how reformed epistemology gives rise to these. So the second vice I'm going to highlight is um, disdain for those who are unlike you. Uh, we see this in the Pharisee in the story. Um, what he does, is he kind of just assumes without even knowing anything about this tax collector story that he's just a lousy guy, that he's just um, a morally retrograde. He has no idea what drove the guy to be a tax collector. Maybe it was a bad, uh, an impoverished family situation and it was the only way he could make money. We don't know. Um, but the Pharisee just assumes that he's a morally bad person. And what I'm saying is that there is an epistemic analog of disdain, which I'm calling epistemic disdain. I say this is, um, you know, not just assuming that others are bad, but it's assuming that others are clever or have knowledge to offer, uh, generally declining to take others seriously as interlocutors. You don't consider individuals on their own merit for what they might have to offer. And this is an epistemic vice because it loses uh, knowledge that the other people may offer you. And it makes other people, you know, if, if, if they kind of realize that you think this about them, that you disdain them, it might make them lose their own confidence and maybe not share their knowledge in the future. So it, there, there's general sort of knowledge loss in society as a whole as a result of epistemic disdain. The third vice is that you overlook, you're not just self-righteous or arrogant, but you overlook specific failings. You know, this is a, this is a very specific thing. Um, the Pharisee wasn't just self-righteous in general, but he overlooked that he was actually just really arrogant. He just didn't recognize that about himself. Um, and the epistemic analog that um, I would suggest I'm drawing from Jose Medina, um, who calls this uh, epistemic vice meta-blindness. You are unaware of specific epistemic flaws that you have. Um, you're unaware, for example, that you're not very good at, at logic or, or, um, or art criticism or something. You just kind of think you're great at all these things and you don't realize. Um, and, and, and not only that, you're unaware that you are unaware of your epistemic vices. So it's called meta blindness because you're unaware of the ways in which you um, just don't get how, uh, what your epistemic situation is. And uh, so this is an epistemic vice because it just keeps you from recognizing and fixing specific epistemic flaws that you may have. If you're just completely oblivious to the fact that you're not very good at art criticism and you think you're great at art criticism, then you're never gonna become a better art critic. And you're probably gonna spread lots of falsehoods about art criticism. So that's why meta blindness is an epistemic vice. Finally, um, the Pharisee in the story exhibits the vice of lack of compassion for those who are unlike him. This is like disdain, but um, it's, 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 it's a little different. So disdain is more like actively hating someone. Um, lack of compassion is kind of not, uh, not being, not kind of 
caring about them, not caring about them. It's just kind of a lack of care more than an act of hate. Uh, the Pharisee could, for example, instead of praying to God in thankfulness that he is not like the tax collector, what he could do is pray to God that the tax collector's situation improve. Uh, but he just doesn't even think to because he just doesn't care about the tax collector. And that's a moral vice. Similarly, I'd like to say there's an epistemic analog to this moral vice that I'm calling epistemic cold heartedness. You don't care about other people's epistemic situation. You don't care that they have true beliefs or knowledge or understanding. So that even if you could help them uh, get knowledge, you, you decline to do so. Like, for example, if somebody's uh, going to a train station and they're pushing a baby carriage and so they, they ask you for directions and you just kind of don't really make the time to think about what they might need. So you send them up a flight of stairs. That's exhibiting epistemic cold heartedness because you don't realize, oh, wait a minute, they have a baby carriage. They can't go up a flight of stairs. You'd, you know, if you were epistemically um, you know, compassionate, instead, you would send them a way that they could get around easily with the baby carriage. But epistemic cold heartedness is not particularly caring or making an effort to help other people in their epistemic gains. And this is an epistemic vice because it, um, it keeps, uh, it's, it's mainly a vice because it keeps other people from getting knowledge. If you could help them in some way to get knowledge or understanding and you don't, then you're detracting from the epistemic situation, from the knowledge of society as a whole. So I think that epi so epistemic cold heartedness is an epistemic vice. Okay, so those are our four epistemic vices, what I want to do now is um, just to argue that reformed epistemology, divine help epistemology more generally, makes it more likely that we will develop these vices, it will, it will cultivate them in believers who subscribe to this epistemology. So first of all, epistemic self-righteousness. Um, as we saw already, divine help epistemology legitimates people in believing that God has specially gifted them, but not others. You know, if you belong to the, you know, the, the one percent or or however many who have been cognitively gifted by God to have true beliefs about Him, to the kind of epistemically elect, then you believe that you are special because of something morally or religiously um, different about you, um, and this makes you, um, you know because you know, we're also human, um, you know, we're not divine puppets. God also leaves us our human epistemic kind of capacities, but he just gives us um, the ability to form true beliefs about him. It leaves you open to being less prone to recognize that you may be mistaken sometimes. Um, and it leaves you less open to maybe um, recognizing that non-believers or people unlike you have insights. And this is, not only problematic from an epistemic point of view, but it's also problematic from the point of view of Christian doctrine, or at least Merrill Westfall uh, argues. So I'll just read this quote. Um, so he says that the, the, the doctrine that I told you about at the beginning of the, um, this, the noetic effects of sin is called the idea that the world has fallen in, in, in a way that has an outworking on our ability to form beliefs about God. Westfall says, well, actually, if you think that this doctrine means that the world is divided into the cognitively elect and everybody else, you're mistaken because what this doctrine actually means when you read the, you know, the famous theologians and the church fathers and possibly mothers, I don't know, who came up with it or who kind of, you know, extracted it from, from Christian scriptures. What it actually says is that, yeah, God helps us form beliefs about him, true beliefs about him, but, um, we're still subject to sin. We're still subject to the cognitive effects of sin. Um, and, and Merrill criticizes planting actually very early on for this very reason. So he says, um, to speak properly of the partial suppression of our natural instinctive belief in God is not to suggest that only unbelievers are subject to the noetic effects of sin, it is rather to claim in, in that in each of us, believer and unbeliever alike, distortions due to depravity from sin are present, but less than total. So that means if you interpret even the Christian doctrine correctly, you get cognitive shortcomings on both sides. And um, in, in promoting this vice of epistemic self-righteousness, reformed epistemology um, seems to get the doctrine itself wrong. So that's maybe, you know, for those of us who want to ground our epistemology in religious doctrine, this is another reason to, to be suspicious of reformed epistemology. 
Okay, so epistemic disdain. How does reformed epistemology promote this or divine help epistemology more generally? Um, well, I suggest that it legitimates believers. It kind of gives believers permission to ignore any genuine insights that they may get from non-believers. Um, McKim kind of talks about this aspect of reformed epistemology. He says, it gives you a bunch of discrediting mechanisms. It gives you a bunch of justifications for ignoring uh, other people for saying that they can't possibly have any insights because they don't belong to your clique. Um, and one might think if you are a reformed epistemologist or if you are a kind of hardcore uh, believing Christian who thinks that God has cognitively gifted you, you might think, well, that's as it should be. <laughs> you know, non-believers don't particularly have any insights to begin with because actually God has not cognitively gifted them in the way that he has cognitively gifted us. But um, in response to that, um, I just like to list three forms of insight that even if this religious worldview is true, that the reformed epistemologists quite like, even if this, this religious worldview is true, um, non-believers still have insights to offer that it's epistemically problematic if we ignore. So first of all, um, so even if you're a cognitive, you know, even if you really are a cognitively fallen non-believer, you still have insights about religion or matters important to religion that you can offer to believers. So one, and I've argued this elsewhere, um, so I'm just gonna go briefly here. One is that, um, there's such a thing as natural reason, and that's a very firmly cemented part of, of Christian doctrine as well. Um, if, so natural reason is just the ability to do mathematics and, and, and to recognize kind of, um, you know, to do science and, and stuff that doesn't involve reasoning about God. So if you use your natural reason, you can still uh, pinpoint genuine vulnerabilities in arguments that believers offer for their views. You can still kind of poke holes in the ontological argument or the cosmological argument, you can still recognize that there's such a thing as suffering in the world and that that's a problem for believers. Um, and you don't need any special cognitive religious abilities to be able to do that. Uh, all you need is just the natural reason that God supposedly, according to doctrine, gifts every human being. And uh, there are lots of you know, very clever non-believing philosophers out there who have done some great work in poking holes in religious arguments. And if reformed epistemology, I think, were to have its way, um, it would legitimate believing philosophers in, uh, in, in cultivating epistemic disdain towards those philosophers who could otherwise help them make their own arguments better. So the second form of insight that a non-believer uh, even a cognitively fallen one could offer uh, a believer, um, it has to do with domains that aren't directly relevant, so aren't directly re relevant to religion, but they pertain to religion in kind of indirect ways. Like um, epistemology is not like a religious uh, discipline, but 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 being um, you know a competent epistemologist can be really important if you want to form beliefs competently about God. Um, and so uh, there are, so, so even if, you know, even if a non-believer isn't like doing philosophy of religion, they might be doing epistemology and, you know, what, what religious epistemology you adopt, we we're talking about here, for example, that can have a really important effect on the way that you form your beliefs about God or similarly hermeneutics, um, how you read scripture or, uh, or, or medicine, um, you know, disciplines having to do with that, that bear heavily on important social issues that religious people really care about, um, um, you know, situations in which, you know, that, that might, that, that might um, affect certain so debates about what's, what's right in terms of, you know, abortion or, or, or leaving a society or what kind of politics we should endorse. Political science is very relevant to religion when it comes to um, um, having a religious community in the context of a broader secular society. Um, and non-believers who are schooled in these non-religious areas have a lot of insights to offer believers in these areas um, that don't directly pertain to religion, but they pertain to religion indirectly in very important ways. They, uh, they're what I call kind of background assumptions or, or kind of auxiliary uh, matters, auxiliary beliefs. So, um, so a, a reformed epistemologist who says, well, um, who, who, who encourages people to cultivate epistemic disdain risks losing out on the insights of such people. Third, there is another kind of insight that non-believers can offer believers. Um, and this we can see when we notice that actually many non-believers 
have become non-believers or have remained non-believers for very good reasons. They have seen the bad sides of religious communities. Um, you know, rampant abuse scandals that have come to light in recent years are only the tip of the iceberg in terms of what has historically gone on, perpetrated by religious communities. And it's not at all surprising that there are non-believers out there in light of these things. You know, what kind of a witness for your religion is stuff like that? Um, and it seems that Unfortunately, a lot of religious believers have been very hesitant to take these kinds of um, scandals on board and to take them really seriously until uh, you know uh, intervention from the outside world has really forced them to in lots of cases. And I think cultivating epistemic disdain for people outside your community makes you prone to ignoring the voices of such people who are non-believers for very good reasons. And I think that this is another, I'm not saying that reformed epistemology kind of endorses ignoring like abuse victims or anything, but what I'm saying is that it cultivates or encourages people to cultivate this vice of epistemic disdain that makes you prone to maybe undervalue the testimony of people outside your community. Uh, I'm not saying that this is something that reformed epistemology does on purpose by any means, but I'm saying it's a consequence of this epistemological view. So these are lots of insights that even cognitively fallen um, religious, so even cognitively fallen non-believers can offer cognitively graced religious believers. And here's another great quote from Westfall. So he says, um, yeah, just kind of pointing out that um, actually, if we notice how closely religion has been has has been kind of tied to corruption over the course of history, um, this won't surprise us. So he says, if we notice the frequent and easy marriage of Christian orthodoxy with various forms of exploitation and domination, we will begin to realize that correct beliefs can be just as useful in suppressing the truth as falsehood can. And this brings us back to our Pharisee. The Pharisee, technically speaking, has all the right beliefs about God, but uh, the tax collector is the one who actually gets it right when he um, you know, humbles himself before God and the tax collector doesn't. So it's just a little reminder that we can actually use our divinely graced religious orthodox beliefs to suppress certain forms of truth in other very important ways. And, um, and that we have to be very, very careful to listen to people who might um, tell us those kinds of things on the outside of our community. Okay. The next vice is meta blindness. Um, and uh, yeah, here I think divine help epistemology just legitimates all kinds of very specific errors of, you know, I mentioned a couple already in terms of maybe undervaluing the testimony of a, an abuse victim outside your community. Um, here's some other examples I came up with. So you might um, hear a sermon in church and you might just kind of on the basis of your spontaneous intellectual seeming or experience, just spontaneously form the belief that God is telling you to do something. Um, maybe it's something innocuous, maybe it's not, um, but maybe he, maybe he's really not, you know, maybe he just wants to tell you something else, but because of any you know, other kind of prejudices or desires that you bring to the situation, you might think that he's really telling you to go out and, um, I don't know, uh, uh, break your diet and, and have a chocolate cake or something. Um, you know, when he's really not, but it's, but you can't really discern because you think, well, my experiences are kind of graced by God. So my experiences are going to be truth conducive. Um, yeah, similarly, a second example I already discussed. There are people out there who, you know, might, for example, see a tragedy like, um, you know, a building hit by lightning or a tornado and destroyed. This has happened uh, in, in recent politics and just say, well, that tragedy happened because the people there were gay. Or, or because they were kind of disobeying God according to my doctrine. And, um, you know, this is a way of, of overestimating your own kind of access to divine truths via your own reasoning processes that can lead to very specific, very problematic errors in judgment. And I'm, again, again, I'm not saying that, that reformed epistemology endorses this kind of thing. I'm saying that this is um, a, a vice that can arise as a natural consequence of, of not kind of thinking through where this epistemology might lead us. Finally, epistemic disdain. Uh, divine help epistemology, um, I think, makes it harder for non-believers to form true religious beliefs. And we're assuming that, that you know, the, this Christian picture is broadly true because that's just the assumption we're working with. Um, and remember, at the beginning, we said there are these two groups of people. There are the kind of cognitively graced believers and everybody else. Um, well, if you think that um, 
you know, if, if everybody's kind of in each camp, they're, all, they're following their own seemings, we say, well, the believers are the lucky ones, their seemings and experiences point in the right direction. The non-believers, if, you know, if, if all, if the only epistemic guidance that you get from your epistemology is that, well, just kind of wait for God to inspire you, wait for God to fix your cognition, and otherwise you can just kind of rely on your own experiences and seemings, just kind of do the best with what you have internally and just kind of hope for the best, hope that God kind of inspires you. There's not really much in the way of epistemological guidance. And that's one reason why I kind of in other work endorse evidentialism, because I think that makes you do a little work. It makes you kind of think a little harder um, and really grapple with the problems about you know, why it might be that God exists or not. But as reformed epistemology stands, it makes matters on the one hand too easy for believers because they don't really have to do any work and it leads to these potential errors. On the other hand, it makes things harder for non-believers because there's no real guidance. All it says is rely on your internal experiences and your perceptions and whatnot. Um, and just kind of maybe God will help you and maybe he won't. That's not really. Uh, and so what I call uh, this is a kind of an outworking of epistemic disdain because when you're constructing an epistemology, you want to help people arrive at what you take to be true beliefs. And epis reformed epistemology doesn't really seem to be interested in helping non-believers become believers. It just seems to be interested in legitimating believers and believing what they already do. And this kind of, this kind of defensive idea of keeping everybody else um, at bay. So I would say that that's... Uh, an expression of, of the vice potentially of epistemic disdain. Right. Um, so maybe for time reasons, I'll omit this objection. Well, and I won't because it's kind of important. I'll be quick. Um, so one might say, oh, this isn't such a big problem. Like, you know, every form of expertise has its, you know, its self-righteous people. And, um, you know, the bricklayer society is probably really self-righteous and vicious epistemically um, when it comes to interacting with the, the non-bricklayers. And like, we don't really worry about Phariseeism among the, the bricklayer society or the Royal Society of, of Art Critics. Um, so why should we worry about it when it comes to, comes to religion? It's just another group of people saying that they have a special kind of expertise. We get that all over. There's nothing really special or problematic about that. But I think that there is actually, because religion isn't like other domains. It involves a special normativity. It's not just epistemic, but it says that, you, that you're religiously special and morally special. And that is very, very weighty from a normative perspective. That's a, that's a big deal saying I'm kind of religiously and morally in a superior position to other people. So I think this is actually a real problem that, um, that, that, that reformed epistemology potentially leads us to. Right. Um, okay, so, um, so Westfall, the guy I mentioned earlier and quoted, he says, um, well, yeah, this is kind of a problem and what we should do is instead of, um, you know, reformed epistemology treats religious beliefs as innocent until proven guilty, because we can just kind of rely on our experiences in God. But actually what we should do, says Westfall, is we should treat them as guilty until proven innocent. We should never, ever trust them. We need a blanket hermeneutic of suspicion. Um, but I think that this actually makes things worse because if we're just suspicious of all our religious beliefs, all our cognition, then we don't really have any way to prove our innocence, you know, to prove that they're ever really innocuous. Um, so I don't think that's a solution. My preferred solution, and now this is the last slide, is to, um, to return to this idea of theolo this theological idea of grace. Now, reformed epistemology likes the idea of grace because it says, you know, God graciously fixes our cognitive faculties, um, at least some of our cognitive faculties. But I want to say, actually, you know, also according to religious doctrine, there's another form of grace out there. It's what we call common grace, not just the special grace for believers, but the common grace that he showers on, um, you know, everyone, whether or not they believe in him or not. And I think that actually, if, remember, if we remember that there's such a thing as cognitive grace, and we think of it maybe in an epistemology of common, uh, sorry, common grace, um, we can think that maybe actually there's room theologically to say that God showers epistemic grace on those outside of our religious community as well as ourselves. And it might keep us, you know, or whoever the believers are uh, slightly more epistemically humble. So that's just a very, you know, brief sketch of where I might, um, you know, repair this, uh, this, this, this um, idea of, of, of theological epistemologies draw more and this idea of grace more generally. Right, well, that's it. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions.